There's some other serious breaks and sprains that I want to talk to you about, but I kind of want to put them in their own sort of segment because this is not something you're going to walk out from. Uh, and chances are you're not going to be carrying the equipment you need to handle those to really truly stabilize them. So the goal with this is to stabilize them as best you possibly can, make them as comfortable as possible, try to prevent further injury, uh, but you're not going to regain mobility from any of these techniques. This is something that's an emergency. You need to get on that phone. If you have a signal, you need to signal for rescue. Uh, you need to make a call and get people coming your way because this is something that's serious that you need to have help getting this person out of, or yourself out of the back country. Uh, so signaling for rescue is another key takeaway from this. Uh, this is not something that you're gonna walk away from. And I'm talking about breaks to the neck and the back, uh, the pelvis or the femur from the mid shaft up to the pelvis, all right? We can possibly handle you know, a lower shaft femur with knee immobilization, but mid shaft and above, it's not something that you're gonna walk out from. Typically that requires a traction splint. That's not something most people are carrying. Uh, same with the pelvis, a pelvic sling is not something most people are carrying. Uh, and C collars and long spine boards or short spine boards even are not something that most people are gonna be carrying. So how do we make this person as comfortable as we possibly can? Well, let's think about what we have with us that we can use in order to do that. Right, if we have a neck injury, the concern is stabilizing this neck to prevent paralysis, prevent further injury, all right? And of course, you've got to get into, you know, kind of that neuro neurological assessment. But if you suspect from your side, if you suspect that there's an injury to the cervical spine or the rest of the spine, keep the person as still as possible, lie them as flat as possible, uh, and make them as comfortable as you possibly can while stabilizing the neck in line with the spine, okay? So we have SAM splints with us. So Typically, you wouldn't stabilize the neck with a C-collar or an improvised C-collar, which is what we're going to make, without also blocking the head off and then securing the rest of the spine to a long spine board or a short spine board. Well, we don't have that available, so we're stabilizing this as best we can with what we have. Okay? If you have another person with you, then yes, you want to maintain that manual stabilization with them at the head, and as you're making this, they're gonna maintain that stabilization until you replace that manual stabilization with this intervention that we're gonna show you. If you don't have that person available, they can hold their head still while you do this, all right? Because you can't sit there the whole time and manually stabilize while you're also constructing this splint and you can't stay there for days. You have other priorities that you need to take care of, all right? So with your SAM splint, a 36 inch SAM splint, we're gonna create an improvised C collar, a cervical collar, okay? This spot right here is gonna be the chin rest. So I'm gonna take this edge here and this edge here and fold it down, kind of like a reverse C curve. And that's gonna make basically a point with a pocket for that chin to sit on. But then I'm gonna place this around the front side of his neck and capture the chin at the proper angle. All right, if I have someone do a manual stabilization, then of course they're gonna maintain that while I work this around. And because he's laying down and I'm by myself, I need to take this end and work it through without moving his head and then bring it up to his chin in the correct position. Any adjustments that I need to make, I need to make right now. This point is in line with his chin. His neck is in line with his spine. This is resting on top of his shoulders. Same with this side. And I'm wrapping that around the back, okay? Again, I would be replacing manual stabilization, but if I'm by myself, I'm gonna bring this across at an oblique angle, kind of around down towards his chest. This gives me the correct uh, angle that I need with his jawline and his neck. Now from here, I'm going to, it'll be hard to see on the side that I'm on, but you'll be able to see it over here. I'm going to pinch those corners to add some rigidity right there, kind of making a post 
on that side. I'm doing the same thing over on this side. And that post gives it some structure, some stability for his neck to sit on. Now I'll take this oblique portion and fold it the rest of the way around, maintaining that angle. And I can kind of pinch that to make it fit right. Then I'm gonna secure that with some tape. Uh, you could use an elastic bandage if you wanted. I'm gonna change it up this time, and just use some tape to hold that in place. So now we have that stabilized and that should prevent any additional injury. Now granted, I don't have this stabilized in relation to this onto a backboard, but you may be able to have some sort of material to improvise that with, but in this case we don't. So what I wanna do is block his head off as best I possibly can with whatever I have available. So I'm gonna go with a wool blanket. Keep in mind you may be out there and this may be the only uh, shelter you have as far as something to sleep in. Um, to keep you warm. So you have to weigh the dangers of, you know, if I unblock his head, you know, is he going to get hypothermic because uh, I took his blanket? You know, which one's, which one's uh, the most dangerous to you at the time? Um, well, we're going to borrow this and just kind of try to create some structure, some head blocks, similar to how we did the wool blanket splint for the lower leg. I'm going to make a horseshoe. to kind of stabilize around. And then what I can do is take sandbags or logs or something to that effect and lay them here to keep this from moving. Or you could secure that in another way. Uh, another technique that I've used is I've used the patient's boots and placed them up here to provide that stabilization. And then I've taped that all together, you know, kind of Use whatever you have available to stabilize this injury as best you can. But this is not something that you're prepared to handle in the field. This is about the best you can do for them uh, to kind of prevent that further injury. After this, of course, haven't already called 911 if you hadn't. Uh, and you have the signal and you have that ability. That should have been done immediately. Uh, and just making them as comfortable as possible, protecting them from the elements uh, until help arrives to help you get them out safely. So that is kind of an, an improvisation for a neck or back injury. This is what you're going to be able to do with what you're carrying. So when we start getting into pelvic injuries, all right, uh, it's going to be very painful first off, and they're not going to be able to walk. This isn't something you just walk off. Uh, a lot of times you have your pelvic girdle, and if you have a break here, sometimes you'll have what's called an open book fracture, where it opens those hips up. The real danger with that is, you know, you're, you have a lot of major arteries that bifurcate right here about the navel and then dive down into the pelvis. Your femorals start up here and dive down into your pelvis and come through. So when that's broken and you have bone shards, you know, there's a lot of danger for internal bleeding here. Uh, and there is uh, your pelvic cavity and your abdominal cavity. You know, those two together, the abdominal pelvic cavity, actually have enough space in them to where you can bleed out completely internally. So really important to stabilize this injury, one, you know, to make it less painful, uh, but two, you want to prevent that internal bleeding as best you can, giving a little bit of compression, keeping everything together, maybe keeping those sharp bone ends stabilized. So you could probably do this with a belt, uh, but another technique that you can use to improvise what's called a pelvic sling that holds it together is to find the iliac crests, which are the top of his hip bones, and then come down a little bit further. That's where you want to have this in line. Bring that up one side and up the other. What I want to do is use this to tie and stabilize those hips. This is a little high. There we go. That's what I want. 
stabilize the hips by tying this together here. That will make them a lot more comfortable and just monitor this and readjust as needed. But this will take those broken hips and kind of fold them back up and hold them where they're supposed to be. And that's gonna be a lot more comfortable for them. Uh, so that's an improvised pelvic sling. When we start talking about mid shaft and above on the femur fracture, that's extremely dangerous. Uh, the muscles in your legs, you've got your hamstrings and your quadriceps, there is a lot of power and force in your legs. And when that bone structure, that bone integrity is broken, what generally happens is those muscles are still contracting and there's no resistance from that bone structure. So it'll actually shorten that leg and a lot of times it'll twist it. Uh, so it's very apparent usually when you have a, a mid shaft or above femur fracture, you'll have you know rapid swelling, rapid bruising, uh, pinpointed pain in that area, pinpointed tenderness. Uh, you could have some deformity. There's a lot of things. It, it could be in an unnatural position, unnatural movement. Uh, another thing to check is, you know, comparing it to the other leg, is one leg shorter than the other? Uh, noticeably shorter than the other, you know, one to three inches shorter than the other where it's been retracted up. This is extremely painful and extremely dangerous because you've got sharp bone ends running very close to the femoral artery. So you want to get some manual traction on there. And by traction, we mean light pressure, sometimes even a little more than light pressure, to kind of pull that back to where you've released some of that tension on it, pull it back to where it's supposed to be, and then stabilize it uh, to prevent that injury. That's gonna relieve a lot of the pain. And we're talking, you know, 10 to 15 pounds of pressure, it really depends on their body weight, uh, but moving it to where it's more comfortable for them and you haven't interrupted the pedal pulses, the, the CMS in that area uh, is a goal. You don't typically carry a traction splint. There are ways to improvise traction splints, uh, but a lot of times since you're not planning on having them move, you know, you're just gonna stabilize this as best you can without a traction splint, using common things that you already have, and you're keeping them comfortable and protecting them from other life threats until help arrives. Uh, so what we can do is called what's called an anatomical splint. An anatomical splint is where you take the injured limb and you splint it to the non-injured limb. And obviously once I do that for this, then he's no longer able to walk and he's not gonna be able to walk anyway, even with a traction splint on, that would be very difficult to do. Uh, so what we do for that, I'm gonna borrow this again for some padding because I wanna pad in between these legs as best I can. If I have another person available that can pull traction on that and get this nice and straight in the position I need it to be in, then I'm going to have them do that while I splint the rest of this. And I could use tape for this anatomical splint, but if I have cotton material, cravats available, then I'm gonna use those, all right? So there is a natural void underneath the knees, behind the knees that we've been placing a little wad of padding under for the other splints. I'm gonna use that to my advantage and I'm gonna route the cravats underneath that. And then I'm gonna kind of scissor slide them up to where I need them to be. So I don't have to move that injured leg any more than I have to. Got my padding in place. I'm gonna secure the injured leg to the non-injured leg. Again, if there was shortening happening, then I would wanna put some manual stabilization, possibly some sort of manual traction to get that back to where it needs to be before I tie it off, but I may not be able to do that. Um, if I'm doing that and it compromises the circulation, the pulse goes away, then I'm not going to do that, okay? Tie those on. And the traction that you put on there, as well as this stabilization, is gonna go a long way towards making them more comfortable and preventing that injury from getting worse. If you have an internal bleed, this also provides some compression. 
you know, that kind of direct pressure that may help slow that blood flow. Check his CMS again, reassess and monitor this at all times. So this is an anatomical splint where I took the broken leg and splinted it to the good leg, okay? That also works really well for minor injuries like a uh, broken finger, sprained finger, dislocated finger, or toe. What you can do is take the injured finger, we'll say that finger's injured, and you can use finger splints. You can use sticks, I've done it with bark. But what you do is take the injured finger and do an anatomical splint where you splint it to the uninjured finger to borrow that support from that one. So that's a simple thing you can do for a broken finger or a broken toe that might make you more comfortable when you're self-rescuing. I can't get the tape off because what had happened was, what had happened was I have risen. <laughs> He's alive! <laughs> and the defendant here, he came behind me and he was texting and driving and he slammed right into the back of me and now I haven't been able to work. Probably won't be able to work for the rest of my life. I think I need, and I'm emotional. Emotional damages too. But I mentioned I'm very distraught by this. <laughs> this is a very good sea collar. It's actually easier to put on than a regular sea collar. You know, it's a, it's a shame the older kids couldn't make it. You know, I got the daughter in the clinic getting cured off the wild turkey. And the older one, he's, the, the older boy, he's preparing for his career. I'm like, oh, you going to college? Nope, carnival. Yeah, he's a pixie dust spreader on the tilt-a-whirl, but next year he hopes to be guessing weight or barking for the yak woman. You ever seen her? Yeah, she's got these horns growing right out above her ears. She's a sweet gal though, and a hell of a good cook. <laughs> That's as much as I got. 